uh, thing I will mention is our agent, uh, Janet DeLong, is not here tonight. She is uh, ill and couldn't make it. Um, our 7 o'clock hearing on the Enclave has been continued to uh, February 13th, and why don't we put them in at 710? Okay. Um, I think you actually need to vote on continuing. Oh, uh, yeah, we will, but okay, that, okay that's... At 710? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll accept a motion to uh, continue the Enclave. I move to continue the Enclave to February 13th meeting at 710. Second. I'll second. second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So we'll move on to uh, 273 Dedham Street uh, and start that discussion a little bit early. So, Jim, no, can't yeah. do it. Yeah. Ah, I was trying. Get that early. Can we do the minutes? Yeah, we'll, we'll read our minutes. Are our minutes here? Yes. Yeah, they should be. I kind of got yeah, the minutes. We have them. Do you have them, David? If not, I've got an extra set. Yep, I have them. Oh. Yeah. Okay. We didn't good. vote for ourselves. Pardon? We didn't vote for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes from the December 12th meeting? No. I'll accept the motion to accept. I'll make a motion to accept the meetings from the December 12th meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passed.
Okay. Is there anything you need to set up, Jim? No, she's got the plans on the viewer. So okay. Okay. couple more minutes before that is I will make a public announcement that we are looking for new members so if you're a member of the town we'd uh, welcome your uh, request to join the Commission who said that Me. see Amy Okay, Jim, you're on. We're talking about 273 Dedham Street. Good evening, Jim Susie with United Consultants. Uh, the project before you this evening is the construction of an 11,250 square foot commercial building with uh, access off of 1A, a uh, little bit of regrading and a parking lot and uh, emergency vehicle access around the back. Can we go to the next page? Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, these are the existing conditions. Right now, this is the building located at 279, where Orlando's Garage operates. Um, this area right here is that 10 to 12 foot high steel fence that's been there forever and ever. Um, and the display area out in the front where he displays the uh, equipment and some vehicles associated with the building. So the proposed layout, um, the building will be in this area here. Uh, access come in and off of 1A here. We've got <coughs> parking here, parking along the front side of the building, and an access way all the way around for the emergency vehicles to, um, to get around. Septic system will be located in this area here, um, and then the Domestic water and the water for fire protection will come in in this location here. Um, can you go wait, to wait, before sure. we get there. Sure. Uh, one of the things Janet talked to me about on Monday before you yeah. came in was that part of your development goes into the next lot, the septic Correct. system. Yeah. Septic and this corner of the, the parking yeah. area lays over on the lot. Because of, it's my understanding, and, and please tell me if I'm, I'm wrong, when they initially permitted 269, 
these four lots have been um, ruled as one parcel, okay? Um, and, you know, Janet had mentioned maybe changing it to 271 and 273 Denham Street, um, but we've listed the two lot numbers separately, so we're, we're calling this building 273 Denham Street because that will be the building address, but on the cover sheet we have listed lot four and five to try to encompass that. Which one is lot five? Oh, in the back? Is four, four and five. five. Um, although technically we've got a little piece of three of three there, but it's all in contiguous ownership and based on the special permit that was granted for this building, this is all being considered one parcel, even though the assessor sent you four different tax bills, correct? Three different. Three different. Who's the owner? Um, 269 Dedham Street, LLC. Oh, okay. Okay. So if we can roll to the next one, Amy, please. <clears throat> so basically I've tried to go with a simplified drainage system um, for this site. So everything is gonna pitch this way. Um, we've got a sediment four bay right here to, to catch anything coming off the parking area. And from the sediment four bay, it will go to a detention area right behind it. And then the detention area will outlet to a rain garden in this area here for exfiltration. We do have a roof leader system, and that will also tie into the rain <coughs> garden. Okay. So we've tried to do it without catch basins and helical separators to um, a drainage system that's very easy to maintain. Basically, once a month you check uh, the rain garden for any debris, pick up the debris, and the sidewalls of the rain garden are three inch thick wood chips. So once a month, you know, when they check the rain garden, if there's any sediment or anything within the wood chips, you just remove them, put new wood chips down, and go on till next month. Same thing with the, the said four bay and the pond over here, they'll be inspected monthly, any debris or whatnot removed from them. How much of the pond is in the 102 foot, 200 foot buffer area? Um, well, we, we don't have anything that's within the riparian zone. This line here would be the 200 foot riparian zone. So we're not doing any work in there. Um, I believe this is the 50 foot buffer to the wetlands, and this is the 100 foot buffer. So we do have a small portion of work being done inside the 50, but if you're familiar with the site, it's entirely disturbed. You can see here's the existing tree line, and we have no work being proposed within that tree line. Um, like, again, like I said, if you're familiar with the, the project, there's um, a fairly large, um, recycled asphalt area in here, and then the rest of it is, is pretty much bare gravel. So the intent is to put the building in, pave around the building, um, and have everything go. Right now you've got basically gravel running off into this large wetland out here that's um, probably a function of the drainage that the town or the state dumped in here, um, and then it goes out back and it opens up out the under back. So you've got basically this gravel lot just running there, unattenuated. So we will be putting measures in so that no untreated storm runoff will get to the, to the wetlands. Which is in the bottom right-hand corner, Alex. Um, now, um, so basically nothing outside the fence is gonna be disturbed. Correct. As the fence is in right now, okay. So again, it's, <clears throat> it's a fairly simple project. Uh, I think you have one more page where you have a planting plan. Aha. <clears throat> so we've got um, coming in the entranceway, um, we've got some large trees 
up here in the back and a couple in the front. There are plantings associated with the rain garden and then we've got some, some other shrubs and whatnot in this area here, uh, this area here, and then these islands out front here. Um, we'll have some shrubs in them as well as the, the large trees, the shade trees. Okay. Since uh, we're at a disadvantage, we don't have any notes from Janet on your meeting. Um, what can you say that you two talked about? Um, the first thing was you can see the 20 foot easement that cuts through here and along the property yeah. line. And the easement line from here to the two crow's feet up in here got erased as part of that. So that was put back. And again, on this wetland line, I had offset the line five feet as a construction line, and that did not get erased. So that was the, the two um, main things that she had. Um, the other thing was she had requested the field data forms. I guess we forgot to send those. I did email those to her this afternoon okay. and brought a hard copy with me in case she hadn't checked her emails. And um, the operation and maintenance plan for the site, which again, I emailed to her okay. and I have a, have a paper copy. Yeah, we don't evening. have them since she was out. Right, I mean, I can give you, I got hard copies I can give Amy. Okay, you give them to Amy. What's that? Oh, that's okay. It, you got it clear with the state. Oh, oh. The, okay, so we change this one up our confirmation from the other. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was one of the same month. Mm -hmm. There's two of them with some errors. But so I guess the O&M and said it's the okay. field data forms. There was forms. enough information for that. Okay. Can you email these to me? And then there's Thank nothing you. we can Should do with the weapon flag until... <clears throat> okay. Um, does the board have, does it have any comments? I guess you talked about some of the, um, said there were a couple of wetland markers missing and a couple that were close together that she had a question about. Yeah. Um, basically, she didn't really say that she disagreed with the line. Just that as she was walking out there, you know, this flag may have been down or tied on something low. Um, I asked her if she wanted us to go out and, and replace them, and she said, no, you don't have to do that. But, you know, I was out there, and I saw that a couple of them were missing. Okay. Is there anybody in the audience that has any questions regarding this? Could you state your name and address for the Anthony Lockerty, 25 Clinton Street. 25. Um, is this a new construction building? It is a new building, yes. Is your pavement going to be pervious or impervious? Impervious. Um, who is responsible for this monthly monitoring that you've talked about about your wood chip uh, areas? Um, the, the owner of the property would be responsible. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. The owner would be, and there's a series of checklists that they have to fill out every month and keep on site. If a question ever comes up from the commission, they would forward copies and Who was that them. forwarded to? Uh, the commission, ultimately. Okay. And the um, wetlands identification uh, from the um, conservation agent was certified? Um, she, she didn't say she disagreed with anything. So and again, she's not here, to, and I don't want to comment okay, that, well, that's for her. Little, but that, I think that's, if she that's had a little it, vague for me, right? Address it to us, but okay, we agree. Those are the only thing I have. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Um, yeah, since uh, Janet isn't here. We can't finalize uh, the notice of intent tonight, mm -hmm. but um, I think we have a better understanding of what the project is. And uh, once Janet gets back, she can fill us in on the details and we should be ready to go, I would think, next month. 
Okay. Um, according to her, I think everything was pretty well said. There was just a few minor things she needed to uh, mm -hmm. get clarified by you. So um, I think we'll, if we could, we'll continue this till uh, next month, okay. uh, and you'll be seeing the planning board next, next week. week. Yes. So uh, that would be good. Uh, motion to continue this. Well, just maybe oh, one oh, question. Oh, do you have more questions? If, yes. I think there might be a little bit, if you were asking about impervious versus pervious, um, if afterwards you want to ask some more questions about where the, where the ending of, of, of the pervious material is and your concern going through looking at the plans, and I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Um, and then I, well, think I haven't had an opportunity to um, look at these particular plans. Okay. Uh, but I'm very familiar with the site when I sat on the boat before with other um, businesses that are down in that area. And it's, it's extremely sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I'm curious as to why they're doing uh, pervious instead of impervious. Well, sometimes we do impervious because we're worried about any of the erosion of the material in the ground. Um, and they can control it a lot better with a non-pervious, with bank, with, you know, non-pervious banking to flow the water into a correct area so it doesn't end up um, in the non-treated area in the, in the watershed. No, that's what I think. Well, it becomes yeah. a planning board. Yeah. Right, you're looking at a, you're looking at a, an impervious parking lot um, with the case space. Do you have a gas and uh, oil separation unit in that? For the building, yes, that's over in this area here for okay. the floor drains. All right, like I said, I haven't had a chance to look at the plan, so yeah, the plans are available at, at the office. I'll, yeah, I'll take a look at them and good, good, continue the meeting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll take a look at them. And then, if you do have any questions after you've looked at the plans, you can always email Amy. Yeah, or and do and it. talk to Janet. Yeah. Yeah. And then, what is it, 10 days if you wanted to be on the meeting, on the agenda? Notice? I think put them on the agenda in 48 hours. Yeah, just yeah. so. Yeah. <coughs> it's if, just if something had to be advertised. Right, so I didn't want you to look at the plans, email us a letter three or four days before the meeting, then you're. You're, you've submitted the letter too late to be on the agenda no, I to speak that. to us. So, been here before. Yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> so, I appreciate your input. Um, I'll accept a motion to continue the 273 Dedham Street until uh, next month, and we'll do it at oh, um, seven o'clock on the 13th of February. Make a motion to continue 273 Dedham Street till 7 a.m. I mean 7 p.m. on November on what February 13th? February. That's right. 2019. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, it's passed. We'll see you next month. Thank you very much. Okay. Cranberry Heights. I lost my pen. Yeah, I didn't hear from them. Oh. Does anybody hear from Cranberry Heights? Okay, I guess we'll uh, continue them one more time. And... Uh, Let's put them on at uh, 7.15. Move to continue Cranberry Heights to the February 13th meeting at 7.15 p.m. Second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So, uh, 7.20, Mass Audubon. Thank you. Welcome. Yep, Mike. Uh, Doug Williams, I'm the sanctuary director over at uh, Stony Brook. 
and I don't know whether you've got pictures or not, Amy. Uh, what I'm proposing is to install two beaver deceivers along a no-named perennial stream that flows out of Bristol's Pond. That's it. Sure. That's beautiful. Okay. Um, so if you're not familiar with this location, uh, the Pond Street recreation fields are right here. So this culvert, <coughs> there's a culvert that goes under Route 115 uh, right here from Bristol's Pond. So this is Mass Audubon property here. And we, um, we have uh, an active beaver colony in Bristol's Pond. And they seem to be interested in moving downstream <laughs> towards the culvert. And uh, so what, what I'm proposing is uh, I, I talked to uh, Mike Callahan, who owns and operates a, a company that puts in water level control devices. And he's proposed putting in one water level control device or a beaver receiver is the other name for these things right at the spillway at the dam and then one more downstream towards the 115 right upstream of the culvert uh, to alleviate the the need for the beavers who are as as the saying goes they're busy they're busy <laughs> uh, yeah so uh, we're just trying to to figure out a good way to keep them happy and keep the flow uh, constant through that area uh, so I've talked to uh, Barry at the highway department. We've been out and looked at it, and and uh, I'll keep working with them. But anyway, that's what I'm here to 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 check with you Does guys. Does the on. company have good success with these? They do, uh, and they've been doing this for quite a while. They've got we've, they've worked with Mass Audubon for many years now, and they have so they've got uh, places around here, and they actually guarantee their work. Mm. Okay. Questions? We read about it, talked about it a little bit at the last meeting, so <coughs> you're good. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? Um, unless somebody would like to take a beaver with them, no. Not <laughs> <laughs> In the audience, can do that. No. No. Uh, yeah, actually, you can't do that. So <laughs> it was you know, a that, trick question. That, the, the alternative for us was, I, I, I'd rather do this. I'd rather, I'd rather take this approach than killing them. Yeah, it seems to be a big, a larger problem this year. Maybe be Framingham is talking about it, and they're going the other route. They seem to have turned up all over the state, and in the research that I've done, uh, it looks like uh, so. This is a more permanent solution. I I know uh, the state came came before the conservation commission, maybe six years ago, to put one in. Uh, on the other side of the road at Bristol Blake State Reservation and it's worked quite well over about uh, the six or seven year period that it's been there. Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you that it does need to be maintained once a year, twice a year. You'll it's, be doing that? We will. The yeah. Audubon. Okay. Um, so I think we've got a Determination of applicability. And it is negative determination number two, uh, where it's the work described in the request is within an area subject to protection under the act, but will not remove, fill, dredge, or alter that area. Therefore, said work does not require the filing of a notice of intent. And then I think there's one also, where's number six? Oh, and also the area, number six, the area and or work described in the request is not subject to review and approval by the town of Norfolk. So you both get the town and the state uh, approval on this. That's great, thank you. So I'll entertain a motion for determination of applicability with those two 
um, negative determinations number two and number six. Excuse me, David. Yes, ma'am. Need to close the hearing first. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, is, if there's no other questions, we'll close the hearing. Is there a, any other comments? I don't know if there was any public comment. Yes. <laughs> yes, Donna Ms. Jones, North Street. I'm in favor of the project. Okay. <laughs> any other comments? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to uh, close the hearing. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, that's passed. Okay, now we'll do the determination of applicability with a negative determination number two for the state and negative determination number six, which is for local. Uh, if somebody would make a motion for that. Make a motion for applicability of the Audubon, Audubon Stony Brook project uh, with a negative determination of number two and a negative determination of number six. All in favor? Second. Second, second please. Second. You're automatic. Aye. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's passed. Okay. Uh, you can pick up paperwork tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Um, the DCR Lakes and Ponds. Um, Is this you again, Doug? It's not my project, but I can speak on it. It's the it's uh, yeah. Bristol Blake State Reservation. Microphone, please. Oh, yep. It's uh, Bristol Blake State Reservation, so it's the state's project. Yeah. But I can probably answer any questions that the commission might have. Uh, do we have any paperwork on this, Amy? Um, only what was emailed. I'm not saying. Why don't we um, defer this until next month? And then hopefully somebody from the state would show up. No, are you? Sure. What? There are maps within there. Yeah, I haven't received this from them, but I know the proposal is to. Uh, the, the state uh, lakes and ponds division came out, did an assessment in the wetlands there. They looked at the three bodies of water. And essentially, uh, my, my concern with it originally in bringing it to the state, uh, I'm guilty, uh, was the water chestnut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the biologist for the state took a look at it and said, yep, actually, this is really, this is serious. And while she was there, she also identified uh, variable pondweed in the wetlands there. Uh, the water chestnut's a little easier to treat than the pondweed, and you can remove it physically. The variable milfoil is a perennial rooted in the mud on the bottom, and when it breaks off, it restarts in other places. Mm -hmm. So they're recommending the use of an herbicide. For yeah, all of I it? think that's what we were looking for, is to get more information on the herbicide, and I don't think we've gotten that yet. I, I yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it. I did talk to the, uh, the the regional science folks in for Mass Audubon who were, you know, once again not happy to have to mm. use an herbicide, but also not seeing any other alternative. Are they going to bring in any cultivator to take away the chestnuts, or just herbicide will do everything? I think it's going to be herbicide. Uh, it's a long, it's a multi-year project that they're proposing, and the idea is to get it to knock everything, all the the invasive stuff, back to a point where we can then. Uh, do it. Uh, re do removal by hand. Oh, okay. Do you have some paperwork? Um, I have the notice of intent and it's got some maps. Um, but <coughs> I 
Because we talked about this about what three or four months ago, the water chestnuts and the removal. No, and that was the it. Pods. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah, you want what's in my mouth? But the same yeah, type of That's concerns the with oh, okay. the, uh, the chestnut uh, pods uh, being removed. It? Yeah. Because of the longevity of the pods and coming back, so we have to load yeah. seven to ten years is what I read. Yeah. And uh, that one of the things that's concerned me and what makes this a long-term project is uh, these seed pods are barbed and they're uh, they're adapted to being spread on the feathers of waterfowl. So as ducks and swans, mm -hmm. and I've seen them on the. I saw. Uh, three swans come flying into a wetland one time and it looked like they all had little black necklaces around the water line. It was all seeds from this water chestnut. Mm. They hit the water, it's there. Okay. Any comments from the public? Then uh, I'll entertain it. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Anthony. Tony Martucci. Um, I'd like to see what the uh, um, aquicide or herbicide that they're going to use uh, because you're all killing our bees um, and uh, that's my biggest concern. Don't want to see an herbicide used uh, that's, that's uh, there are several other methods for getting rid of um, aquatic plants besides herbicides. Thank you. Um, and that's the, our concern. We, or our questions is what is the herbicide? Give us the MSDSs, the hazards, and all that information. And I think we have some of it. But again, um, without somebody from the state here and also without Janet, uh, I don't feel comfortable of taking this forward and giving them the notice of intent. I don't think we have a NOI number yet from no. the state. No. Oh, okay. So um, if there's no, is there any other comments? Then uh, I'll entertain a motion to uh, close the hearing on uh, the DCR. Uh, continue it. Continue it, yeah. To continue it till uh, next month at uh, 7 uh, 25. Move to continue the DCR hearing to February 13th. Um, meeting at 7.25 p.m. Okay, second. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's passed. So 7.25 will meet them. If you could notify the state, Amy. Yep, I will. Okay, uh, NSTAR. Is somebody from NSTAR? Okay. Yes. I'll set up the whiteboard too, so um, just won't want to be in front of that. Okay. Thanks for hearing me tonight. My name is Dave Clinch. I'm from Epsilon Associates. I'm here representing uh, NSTAR, doing business as Eversource. Um, <clears throat> the project that's before you this evening is a geotechnical boring program, but let me give you a little bit of information as to why they're doing it. It's a larger project. It'll come before you probably late in 2019, and what it's for is another set of poles on the right-of-way. It's a circuit separation project. As you're aware on this right away, I'm sure you guys drive, drive, out, drive by it all the time. It's, it's pretty full. You've got wooden H frames, metal latticework structures, monopoles of that sort. There's a lot of structures out there. One of the structures, it's on the southernmost edge of the boundary of the right of way, actually has two circuits on it. So you'll see six conductor wires because each circuit is made, of, made up of three, three phases. And the New England ISO, the independent system operator who evaluates the electrical system and 
indicates to the utilities when additional electricity is needed in different locations or when there's a problem. Uh, identified the two circuits, they're called 122 and 135, as being at some risk. And the reason they're at some risk is they're on the same tower. The tower is an existing monopole with three davit arms on either side. And each of those three davit arms holds one conductor. Again, each of the three conductors making up one circuit. So the New England ISO, in their order a couple years ago, had this project listed to, what's to do what's called a circuit separation project. Effectively, what's going to happen is the installation of an additional set of towers, one for one, on the right of way. So everywhere there's a tower now, there will be a second tower adjacent to it pr in pretty close proximity, as close as it can be put within compliance with the, the natural, National Electric Safety Code. So the way it would work was they'll go out there, they'll put in foundations, they'll build those towers, and then they'll take one set of conductors off the existing structure, put them on the new structure, take off the three davit arms, and they're done. None of that work is in front of you, but I wanted to provide that for context because that is why the project that is before you tonight is, is proposed. It's a geotechnical boring program. Uh, you may have been aware of this. I know you guys have seen lots of utility projects before. I've been here years ago, but uh, there's a lot of them out there. And the different types of foundations that they could use, um, you know, most commonly it's a, it's a caisson, basically just a metal pipe filled with concrete. That works when there's overburden, soft soil. Um, oftentimes you come into rock or ledge, and in those cases a caisson is not an appropriate foundation type. They use what's called a micropile. Uh, they would typically go in with a drill rig and drill a series of holes into the rock. Depending on the size of the tower, it could be a dozen to 15 holes. And then they put in bolts, grout them into place, and use that to bolt the tower to because they couldn't get the depth they would need above that rock with a caisson. So we have 18 structures. Uh, the project goes through six towns. Um, so it's a long project. It uh, starts in Medway, Eclipse Bellingham, has a long stretch in Franklin, a short stretch in Millis, a long stretch in Norfolk, and some in Walpole. Franklin and Norfolk make up about 75% of this project lengthwise, and there are actually 18 structures here in town. Of those borings, seven of them fall within bordering vegetated wetland. One of them is within riverfront area, and two of them are within the 100-foot buffer zone. So there are 10 of these structures out of the 18 that are here in town that are jurisdictional. The total length is 3.2 miles. Uh, all the impacts that are associated with this project, which are not insignificant, are temporary impacts insofar as it's largely matting. The construction matting that will be used to access the boring locations, uh, obviously it's a temporary impact, but it's an impact. And after completion, those areas that mats need to come out, the area needs to be restored. That restoration generally is filling in of ruts, uh, removal of any type of debris, and if needed for stabilization, they'll seed it and mulch it. A lot of the access roads, a lot of these wetland impacts are on access roads that are access roads, gravel access roads. However, uh, there's so, it's such a long line and uh, so many low places where they haven't brought in a lot of gravel. The access road itself is a jurisdictional wetland. I did some of the flagging myself with a team of a bunch of folks this last summer. Um, there's not really a reasonable maintenance provision whereby the utility can go in there and say, well, it's an access road, but hey, you know, there's soft rush growing there, there's hydric soils there, that, that's a wetland. So that's the types of wetlands we're talking about. But there are some locations where we have scrub shrub wetlands that have a structure where there is no road. And in those cases, what would happen would be a, a flail mower, a chain mower uh, it would go in. The right of way is pretty regularly maintained. It's cut every three years or so. Uh, they're not using herbicides to maintain those right of ways, at least not in this section that I've ever seen. Uh, rather, it's, it's mechanically cut. So they will mechanically cut the path through the wetland, leave the stumps or stubs of the brush and shrubs at ground level, and place mats over them. So they don't, they don't, we, don't, we don't stump anything. We don't dig out those roots. Uh, you've probably seen it before. Uh, within a year to two years, the stump sprouts from those shrubs and saplings revegetate pretty well. Oftentimes, it's thicker than what you actually see prior to the project happening. But that said, it is monitored. And if there's an area that doesn't regrow, it's stabilized and planted with native grass seed if it's not an existing gravel access road. 
So the total temporary impacts to BVW are 15,875 square feet. For riverfront area, we've got 7,000 square feet of riverfront area adjacent to the Charles River. There's 400 and about 460,000 square feet of riverfront area on the right of way. So this represents less than 2%. The actual work itself is a four and a quarter inch hollow stem auger. So it leaves about a six inch hole in the ground. They put the cuttings back into the hole tamp it, seed it, mulch it, walk away. If the work is within a wetland, they do put typically a fiber mulch log, but if the commission has any additional requirements for sedimentation or erosion control, we can use those, but typically a mulch log on the down gradient side. Uh, there is an error in the notice of intent that I filed, and I failed to check the box for a limited project. So under 3 cent, 310 CMR 10.53, it is a limited project for utility construction mm -hmm. purposes. Uh, if you'd like me to resubmit a form that checks that box, I'd gladly do that for you. Um, I guess the last thing I'd mention is this work is preferred to the extent possible to be done under frozen ground or snow conditions. We're lacking in snow this year, uh, but if February, March, realistically March, is cold enough, if the ground is frozen, it's just less impact. It's less work for the utility to go back and fill in ruts and such. Even the matting itself is, is, is better on the frozen ground, but it also allows them to not use matting in uplands. And they will. I mean, obviously, in the wetlands, they're using matting no matter what. But in parts of areas where the uplands have soft soil, they don't want to sink in with the drill rig, so they use matting there too. So if it can be done in that March time frame, that would be great because we can at least count on a chance of having frozen soils. Um, and as I mentioned, we will be coming back to you with a comprehensive notice of intent. There will be some permanent wetland impacts associated with those permanent structures. We'll have a mitigation plan that meets the bylaw standards, which are significant. Um, and at this point, if there's any questions I can answer for you, I, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. I think the, our concern would be in the wetland areas that um, how close are you getting to them with the co construction vehicles? Because if anything should happen and those are contaminated, then we have a bigger issue. Yes, sir. That, that's a sensible question. Um, the time frame it takes for each individual boring, anywhere between about an hour and four hours. Um, so the equipment, a drill rig specifically, and only a drill rig, will go in on the mats to complete the boring. Uh, from a protective protection perspective, the Eversource specifications don't allow for fueling within the wetland. Um, Honestly, the drill rig doesn't need, it's, it's not a diesel uh, backhoe or something that's really sucking a lot of fuel. It's a drill rig, so they have fuel once a day off-site. So that drill rig will go in there, and it's not allowed to stay in there overnight. It goes in, and it comes out. But in terms of proximity, it's, it's not just close. In some cases, it's in the wetland. Mm -hmm. uh, I can show you an example here. A, reason, a reasonable example. So in this location, they're going to be about 15 feet within the wetland for that structure. Uh, we have gone through an avoidance and minimization process, and when we come in with the full project, we'll, we'll document that. But because of turning angles, th that's really why the ones that are in the wetlands are in the wetlands, because when they turn, they're more robust structures, and they can only move them so far. So this actually was moved almost 100 feet, but it's still about 15 feet within that wetland boundary. And when I come back to you, I'll be coming back here with a Eversource engineer who did the design so that he can answer some questions. I, I am an engineer, but I am not in any way a design engineer at all. Okay. Um, so the total, the total time frame for the geotechnical boring program that's proposed here is about two weeks, um, assuming you know, relatively decent weather. If it's a really bad storm, they won't be out there. Um, if there's any chance of lightning in the winter, you don't get that, but they won't with the drill rig masked up. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of careful health and safety issues with having a drill rig next to a live line, which is effectively what we are going to have here. But I can commit, and this can go in the order uh, to whatever extent you feel comfortable with it. The drill rigs will go in and out. None will be left in a wetland or a resource area overnight and none should be there for more than about half a day. What's the worst case scenario beyond uh, inadvertent spill? 
drill rig breaks down, has to get towed out, something of that nature. But even if that was the case, it would get towed out of the wetland and stored in an upland area for, for the evening. Um, typically, we provide the commission a notice when it will start, offer a site walk, offer a site walk afterwards. You have the jurisdiction to go there anytime if you want in any case. But so that you know when there's something worth seeing out there, we'll do that and happily go out there with you. Um, I do expect to need to confirm all of the wetland boundaries this upcoming year. Um, to be entirely frank, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. I'm not going to fight about wetland boundaries because if it moves 10 feet one way, 10 feet the other, the only real effect is the total area of compensatory mitigation and restoration I have to provide because largely the roads are where they are, the structures are going to go where they're going to go. Um, so I'd, I'd happily do that if you have a preference as to filing an ANRAD, approving it under an NOI, whatever your preference is will go along with. Yeah. Have you talked with Janet yet? Uh, one of my colleagues, one of my yes. direct reports has, has discussed the filing with her, but we mm -hmm. did not discuss you know, future filing or getting okay. out there to review the lines, which we're happy to do. Okay. Yeah, I think we would want the statement that uh, the equipment has moved out um, just so that the worker bees know what they yes, have sir. to do. Yes, sir. Especially when it gets you know, cold and in the afternoon and I'll just leave it here. <laughs> right. Um, one one thing we do do is um, make sure that the wetland flags are up when they go out there to do those borings so they know where the boundary is. Um, more often than not, it's a requirement of most of the commissions for this type of work that there's some level of oversight. Uh, so there's no problem with, with a c condition to have an environmental monitor to, to mm -hmm. oversee that work when it's in resource areas. That's common and we're, we're happy to do it. We're ready, we're ready to do okay. it because we do it all the time. So if that's your preference, we can certainly do that. Okay. We can also provide documentation as a common request of an order of conditions, take photos of the areas before and after. Um, so that, that's also something that, that we're happy to do if that's helpful to you. Okay. Questions? Just, um, I think one thing that helps the neighbors is to provide them with an email that they could, during the project, if they see or have a question that they could with your filing, um, send you an email to comment to say, geez, it seems like a little different from what we talked about or, or I saw, you know, something out of the ordinary happening. You have a list of the abutters? Uh, we do have a list of the abutters. I, I don't specifically have their emails. They okay. get notification, but I, I, mail. I would happily do that. Eversource has their whole outreach program with full-time people who do that work. Um, I, I got the certified abutters list myself for this. I shared it with them. Okay. Um, if there's any other mechanism, we, we've used, uh, you know, they, they have a 1-800 number, but mm. people a lot of times don't use it. We, we put out door hangers. Most of the time, those things get circular filed pretty quickly. Um, but certainly, they're going to get the green card notification. Anything above and beyond that is not a problem. So if there's a way to get some type of information, that would help us notify the neighborhoods. We, we certainly could do that. And it is. It's, it's, there are sections where uh, you, you've, got, you've got homes that are uh, uh, less than 100 feet from the right-of-way, certainly visible to the right-of-way. Mm. Uh, there are long stretches as well that are seem pretty remote when you're out there, but, but a lot of it is near, near residential areas. Yeah, would, you know, just as when you notify the abutters, just allow them include the email address of the section that would be able to answer their questions. That makes sense. Alex, Bruce? Are there any questions, comments? If you would pick up uh, the yeah. microphone. Hi, State I'm your name. Teresa Knowles. I live at 20 Dean Street. Um, I have two questions. And if this isn't the right one, you just tell me to stop. I have a question. How close is that to the gas lines? Because I live right there. So I further. know where your gravel They're is. They're further from the gas lines than the structures now. Inside this way from the gas line? Mm. Correct. The, okay. the gas line is on the southern edge of the right-of-way. Right. So these structures are north okay. of the southernmost set of structures. OK. And my second question is, email is not good enough for abutters. 
because when they're out there, nobody's looking to see if someone's emailing them. I personally want them to come up to the house or we will personally go out <laughs> and see them. My only other thing is Eversource just did new polls and the subcontractors did a very good job. But the cleanup part was not. So if you were, they're supposed to clean up and put the soil back, I would be very, very. Was that next to the railroad tracks or where? Where are you talking about? On the high tensions from this side of the skating rink down to the DPW. Okay. On the Millis Norfolk line. That's not cleaned up. So if you're worried about them cleaning up and putting wood chips, I'd be very worried about that. Sorry. There's, there's no wood chips. Um, it's a, it's or whatever a, it's you're a doing. Lower. It just gets mowed and spread out. It just gets blown all over the place. And also you area. have used um, herbicides out there. So that's the, all I have to say. On the southern boundary of the right-of-way, there's been no herbicide use uh, in at least 12 years on that, on that section. But I'm sure they use it in their program. They're allowed to by the VMP. Um, my my yeah, suggestion they do, is they do these come locations. Out. They do. So, it, anyhow, a good, a good. Can I separate topic? A good point was raised there, which was work on the right of way. Um, there is a ton of work on the right of way, right? There are that I'm and aware of at least four or five projects on the right of way, and and I say that because I think it's important for people to understand that there are constantly jobs going on out there on the different circuits, and the majority of that work is maintenance work that that typically doesn't require additional regulatory approvals to complete it. This project really doesn't meet the standards for a maintenance project. Typically what the, 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 the Department, Department of Environmental Protection requires is that you know, new structures or replacement structures would be within 15 to 30 feet of the existing structures. This is a whole new line of structures, so as close as they are, there's no suggestion here that this is maintenance, yeah. but I can say that for all the work that's going on out there, no work associated with this project or the forthcoming project is has begun at this time. Okay. Okay. First, I have to disagree with you about the use of pesticides and herbicides. They used herbicides in that uh, utility line three years ago, and I have documentation of that. Um, my second question is, uh, you, why are you doing test borings instead of GPR? Uh, GPR is not suitable to, for, for this type of work. It's, it's the, these, the caissons, if they were caissons, would be 25 to 35 feet deep. So GPR won't, yeah, won't cut okay. it. Okay, I didn't realize that it had to be 25 feet deep. Okay. It, it, we do, it's a good question because we do use GPR in locations where we know we have shallow bedrock. So if we're saying bedrock is less than maybe 10 feet, yeah, GPR works great. For these, we know that the majority of this right away is going to be caissons because from the boring logs we have from the installation of the last set, they were down, well, a lot of the borings went to 30 feet, no rock. There well, was some already a lot of documentation between Cleveland Street and 115 that it's all ledge. So I don't understand why they're doing boring, test borings. They just, did, they just did the new towers in there, and it's all ledge. Every, every single hole that they they drill uh, every single hole that Upland drilled was ledge. I believe it. What is your er erosion control methods going to be? Uh, as I mentioned, the only erosion control that we have is typically at two places. One is downgrading of the boring itself. That boring that they'll do in an hour to four hours, they'll have downgraded erosion controls. We'll use whatever the municipality typically likes. What we use, if there's no other preference, is a mulch fiber log. I like the mulch fiber log uh, because it's biodegradable. When the contractors are done, they can cut it, take the wrapper like a sausage casing, and throw that away. But they can spread the inner part of the mulch because it is just, just mulch. If the access road goes into a wetland where there is no road, the entrance way, for lack of a better term, would have erosion controls in sort of a Y formation at the entrance to where the mats go into the wetland. So that if trucks come out and they had dirt on their tires, if it came off outside the mats, it would be theoretically, you know, controlled by that S&E control. Uh, they shouldn't be, you know, e 
the, sh the mats are clean before they come to the right away. If they move them on the right away, they clean them in place before they move them. And the truck tires should also be cleaned. It's not actually for mud, it's for invasive species management, but it does get the mud off because the mud's the best way for those invasive species to move around. So that's what they're, that's what they're proposed, that's pretty standard. Okay, so we already know that the, that the access road stops at the top of the hill between Cleveland Street and Route 115, and then goes down to the wetlands. So you have a very steep hill that goes down to that stream. That stream has been polluted, um, not only by all of the operations that have been going on there, but by whatever, uh, I think back then it was Boston Edison, whatever they sprayed under those towers, absolutely nothing grows there. And that was probably 25 years ago. My guess is it was probably dioxin. And it has polluted that whole area. The erosion control does not exist. So I would like to know what your specific plan is for erosion control when you start driving vehicles down that very steep hill towards that street. You have to show me where it is in the map because I don't even know the spot. Uh, three, tower, the three towers up from Cleveland Street. I'm happy to look at it if you want to look at it together, but again, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you just offhand. I'm happy to look at it, though. So this is, it's going from west to east as we turn. Right. So you see a street crossing on the next sheet. Crossing west of Rockwood. We get to that's going across the existing road. And we go two more road crossings. Identified. There are there's no public streets here. These are okay. right away road. So that's your that's that's your last one. That's the end of the project at Sea So there's only two public roads. Okay, so Sea is going so this this follow this line here back to where you cross Cleveland Street. So that's this line right here. Right? This is that's the, the that's that's the pond off of that. Yeah, I know where that that's that's the pond off of the far end of the clean with the doors open. Keeps going. Right? This, this is coming around. Clean this, we should be over here. Okay, tell you what, why don't we look at that offline? Um, but yeah, it is an important uh, point that we should uh, evaluate. No, they, have, they, have had, they have had very little uh, erosion control in the past, and that stream has like been totally impacted. Yeah. Um, which is what my concern is. Okay. I, I can say with certainty that it, and when you say there's little erosion control, I, I guess you mean control or actual management of eroded areas. And, and when I say erosion controls, I mean best management practices, hay bale, silt fence. You just farm. had several different machines there doing those new towers that you put in, sure. right? Okay. No erosion control. I, and, and again, I, I don't know where the road you mentioned is, but I can say that there is only sedimentation and erosion controls, physical barrier controls, when we're in or near wetlands at, along the, the, the timber mats and at the borings. And as soon as those areas are restored, they come out. So there's no program, it's not a right away maintenance program. The, the sedimentation and erosion controls for this project are just specific to the borings. They go in when the area is stable, they come back out. Right, and what I didn't see on your plan was the fact that the road ends at the top of the hill uh, off of Cleveland Street and then reestablishes itself on the other side coming back in for Route 115. Okay, uh, after we close this, if you can talk to them and maybe look and circle them and try to identify where it is. Are there any other comments from the uh, audience? 
Uh, Peter Lopes, I live on Seekonk Street, right next to the power lines. Um, lived there for 43 years. We actually own two and a half acres under the lines itself. But over the years, we've kept a border of trees and brush between the house and the lines as a protector, as kind of a, a, a shield, if you will. And, uh, but I always had an access in the back that I could take my dog for a walk in the back, which I always did. Not so bad over the years, except for one time when they came in with the, with the uh, herbicide and started spraying, and we had to jump in on that. Once in a while, we have to jump in when they come in with the, uh, with the machines to, to grind up the stuff. And just recently, it's, the activity's become very heavy. And they've actually uh, clear cut all that area, including part of my natural barrier, uh, and left shards of, of uh, wood and brush that I can't even walk my dog in there because they're too sharp. No cleanup was done. And if, when you start talking about doing drilling and, and everything else going on, and by the way, that's a wetland on both sides of Seekonk Street there. There's a, there's a stream that goes through, there's a little pond. And that's been, had trouble over the years where when it get filled in a little bit, then we ended up with a large puddle in the road when we had heavy rain. I don't know what's going on, but I want to know if these plans will be available to view in the office? Yes, yes, they will be. And if on those plans, do you show where you intend to drill? We do. You do? Great. You mentioned that you're going to put in new poles, and then you also mentioned you're going to put in new towers. Which is it? Poles or towers? <clears throat> when I think of poles, I think like a telephone pole. When I think of a tower, I think of these metal stanchions that stand up out there. Do you know which it is? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and again, it's not part of this project. It's part of the future project. But, but this is the base for that project. So I'm concerned about the future. A absolutely. All I'm saying is we're not asking for talk permission about to now. put in structures. I'm just, just for clarification purposes. Um, when I say poles, I mean any kind of, any kind of pole. The specific type of structures that are going to go out there are called uh, monopoles. And they're the, the, single, the single structure metal. Uh -huh. And if you are familiar with, well, the easiest way to put it is this. On the southern edge of the right-of-way, there's an existing Nothing line of structures, and this will look exactly like those structures. They're going to be duplicated. Okay. okay. So right now there were three sets of those poles or structures, if you will, that are carrying wires up and down the easement. Seven. Seven? There, there are seven different circuits. There are diff no, seven different sets lines. of structures. Let me put that way, three lines. And you said you're going to add another line? There's no, well, yes, I'm, I'm confused about the three lines. I'll, when, I, when I said seven, there are seven different sets of structures along the right of way. They're not all continuous. In some places you get five, but yeah. th so the southernmost one will effectively be duplicated. There's no addition of a line. There's no addition of a circuit. There's two circuits on one tower, called, to use that term tower for monopole, and we're going to take the two circuits that are on one monopole yeah. and take one circuit off and put it on a new monopole, specifically to provide additional resilience if a tree falls, if there's a catastrophic accident, if something happens. Only one set of lines is damaged rather than both. And that's a direction from the New England ISO. That's not a, an Eversource choice. They certainly, certainly don't want to do it if they don't have to do it, but they have to do it. So next to each pole, or next to each tower, you're going to have another tower. Is, is that what you're saying? We're getting a little bit offline. Okay. We're concerned with the, the I, water and the I got you. The water, the cleanup, uh, the, the way they essentially have, have uh, now opened up that whole area to my home. And I don't like that. Like I said, I lived here yeah. for 43 years. I never had that issue before. This is a new one, and all the activity that's taking place, I mean, there's trucks every morning start at 7 o'clock in the morning, yeah. but that, but that we're doesn't not, bother me yeah, to the we're point not where involved the cleanup in, in the one, water. But what we can do is work with them on this project as it goes forward to make sure that they have the uh, barriers in the right places, that everything is flagged, and that um, every step of the way they do what they say they're going to do, and it, when they leave, 
it's not disturbed except for the boring holes. And that's fine. But I just want you to remember that this is the preliminary to another bigger project yes, yes. that's going to be happening this year. Yes. And so, no. No, no. That, it's not. No, the said it was. And nope. I said the 19. application will come this year. When we apply for something, it takes sometimes two or three years for the construction to, to, to begin. I know, again, it's a little bit off topic. Well, God but willing, I'll still be alive. Say it would be, <laughs> it, it'd be 2021, 2022, and there is no vegetation clearing proposed for that new project. No, there's no vegetation to clear. And by the way, and I missed out one other thing. When you did this, just recent clearing, and, and I'm not just talking, I'm talking to you because you're representing Eversource or whatever, uh, but when you did this recent clearing, they removed 150 feet of my border wall, a nice rock wall that goes around my entire property. They removed it. It's gone. What, they, did, did you respond to them, and what do they say? I, I, I can't get anybody to answer the phone, <laughs> including the number that you had on the, on, the in, that, on the letter that you sent to us. Nobody answered that phone. Nobody be, no, left, uh, I left voice messages. Nobody called me back. So, I mean, I don't know. If it's going to be any better going forward, but it's not any good right now. You know, I might uh, point you to uh, Rich McCarthy, our town planner, and he might be able to assist in somehow um, for that. For what? Well, for what's going on out there. He may have knowledge of it. And the communication part of it, you're talking about? Possibly. I don't know. I, but he's the town planner, so he's got all the committees like us and uh, ZBA and all, and the planning board so uh, he can get uh, I'll give you a business card to anyone who wants one I'll get you in touch with whoever you'd like to talk to yeah okay so I yeah let's end that conversation anything regarding <coughs> yeah. just regarding the wetlands and conservation please so as you anticipate about a month it'll take to do this project? Is that what you said? Uh, uh, the borings, if the weather is decent, it'll be done in a month or less. You know, if they get two straight weeks of heavy rain, they won't go out there. But right, the then work then itself. By yeah. the way, Len Kaufman, 113 Wildwood Road, Norfolk, Massachusetts. Uh, River's Edge, we have 180 units for seniors, and we're adjacent to the uh, high-tension wires. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about the noise level? Is that going to impact our lives negatively? Well, for a month, you know, from seven. But it has nothing to do with the water and conservation. I don't. If we're talking about the drill rigs, you're going to hear you're going to hear yeah. drill rigs from 7:30 to 4:30 p.m. for at least I would say at least two weeks up to a month. Drill it's it, they're they're out there right now all the time. So if you're hearing them, you yeah, you may continue. Topic, yeah. yeah. Right. I have no idea what the decibel uh, number is for drill rigs. Do you have an, any other comments? Uh, just uh, would, would Dave be able to, to would, uh, uh, transfer a couple of questions to the engineer who's going to be here a month from now? Would you be able to uh, listen to these questions so you can, so you can of course. address them? Who can address them a month from now? S certainly. This is a one-for-one one deal. Uh, a second tower will go up, and, and the well, the radiation level. No, no, that's no, no. off topic. This is the conservation commission. This right. is this is nothing beyond that. So we need to deal with our topics. What commission would handle this? None, but I'll talk to you in the hallway if you want. All right, thank you, Dave. The energy facility siting board. This is a state agency that does it. I'm happy to answer your questions thank outside. You, thank you. Yes. George Gray, 45 Wildwood. I'm uh, one of the managers at uh, River's Edge, okay. and I could be a point of contact if he's interested. I represent 140 units. Oh, okay. Yeah, talk to him after the meeting, and that would be good. Anybody else have a comment? So it looks like we have to clear up the paperwork a little bit, Dave, right? Um, there was a box you need to check. The limited project. Yeah. Um, if you want to send that in, the, your notice of intent, and uh, we'll vote on it next month. Sure. I don't think you need to be here. I think we'll have enough information. I'll ask Janet. Sure. I'll make sure she has your card. And uh, if there is something, she'll, we'll let you know. Sounds good. But otherwise, we can proceed next month um, with the documents. I think one thing to put it, everything at ease, we need a couple of of things one is 
at least one person watching each machine that's doing the borings as an independent source. And we need to be able to have all our neighbors here to be able to get in touch with somebody as this project's going on. And I understand it's going to be a never source contractor, but whoever's in charge of the project, they shouldn't feel um, like some have expressed their point on other projects that um, things have been going wrong and they don't feel they have a choice or they've tried to contact someone and it hasn't happened. So, um, totally understood. So if, if you include those on there, um, I, I think those are good comments from the people who came today and they have you know, legitimate concerns. Um, as far as what we can control at this meeting is the borings, the way the borings are done, and how any borings are going to affect any persons as long as they follow the, the timeline that's allowed by the town for the hours of operation for those, that type of work. Understood and I agree. We'll make sure we have all the contact info. I'll provide it to you. Uh, we're going to probably spread it out a variety of different ways, but we'll make sure you have it. So okay. if anybody calls you, you'll have that. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I have one more question. Yes, Anthony. Tony. Um, do you have a... Uh, Address it to the commission. You, does they, does Eversauce have a, a hazmat plan in place with their presentation for a hydraulic blowout from the drilling rigs? Right, but that's a that's a fluid control um, program, not a hazmat program. If, if you have a hydraulic, if you have a hydraulic blowout in one of those machines in the wetlands, what is your hazmat program? There's a spill re response plan as part of the SPCC, and the spill response plan has the details for the cleanup. Ultimately, the contractor is required to clean it up. They typically use clean harbors. There's several other companies that do it. Pick it up, they put it in a barrel, then they go back. That's the same thing. <coughs> What's the chain of command on that? Who gets notified? Who gets notified? Yeah. When there's a spill. Kurt, Dave, uh, could you take the mic? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. When there's a spill, DEP is notified. Only the DEP. The DEP. So the conservation agent is not notified. If, if there's a jurisdictional issue, such as a spill in a wetland that requires a cleanup in a wetland, that's not a notification, but, but, but it would be required to be reported to the commission, and if required, permitted. Would that be in the notice of intent? We could it doesn't need to be in the notice of intent because that's a state law. It's a requirement. We don't, you know, we don't cover every single you know, what would happen if situation. There's a law to cover that, and, and they're obliged to follow those laws. They're referenced in both the SBCC plan and their company policies. So, I mean, uh, that, that's... At construction sites, I mean, that's pretty common. The SBCC and the SWIP has to be kept on site and with the contractors at all times, so they should always have it on site. Anybody who goes there who has jurisdiction to get under the right-of-way, including the commission, you know, can ask to see those or for copies. That's, 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 that's every project everywhere. Order conditions. Okay, we'll, we'll look at it. Um, regarding the SWIP, it, apparently it hasn't been submitted yet. Uh, it, the project is covered by NPDES Construction General permit, but no SW Triple P has been submitted. There would be no for the boring program. That yeah, standard be, eight. That, that would not trigger the preparation of the SWIP or the submittal of a construction general permit because it doesn't alter greater than one acre. Okay. But, but that said, a SWIP has been developed for the project, and I'm happy to share that with the larger project. Okay. But the construction general permit won't be applied for until 2020 or 21 because it's only done about two weeks before work starts. Okay. So 
we do regularly give the SWIFT inspection reports to the commissions if you'd like. I'm happy to do that. We get to send them out to a whole bunch of folks anyway. Okay. We'd appreciate that. Sure. Thank you again, Dave. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, a motion to continue this until um, next month. And we'll do it at um, 7.30. I think is open. <laughs> okay, I'll make a motion to continue the uh, NSTAR doing business as Eversource NOI until the February 13th meeting at 7.30. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yes. Okay. All right, now, um, we have uh, Sandy Maya. Come forward, please. Hi. Hi, Sandy. You need a microphone. You just need a microphone. Oh, there's one. Uh, Okay, you're on. Hi. So thank you for meeting with us. Um, I had sent a letter uh, yeah. earlier this week and raised a few wetlands issues. Yes. That I'm hoping you can help with. Because I was directed to your. Board. Okay. <laughs> um, we're a little bit um, at a loss because our conservation agent isn't here today. She was out sick. So. Um, why don't you go over what your concerns are? We can talk about them, but uh, we'll continue it until next month. We can, we'll, when Janet's back, we can get into it deeper. All right, so there were several issues that I brought up. Uh, one was whether or not the tail race was a river and should have riverfront area. And I do have with me, in case you don't have it, do you have the environmental notification form uh, from you the preserve at Abbeville? Hasn't come before it yet. Um, Wh whose environmental that, form? Uh, the net, the other attachment. Amy. Uh, proposed figure seven. There you go. All right. So if you can enlarge that up into the area where it says it already says two hundred foot riverfront area around the tail race. I think I can just point it out. If you you got to bring it down a little bit. It would be up further. Can you? S okay, let's see. All right, so you need to go down a little bit more. All right, here it is. So right there, it already calls it out that it's 200 foot riverfront area. And if you follow the line all the way down, it goes around the tail race. So I tried to bring it up at the ZBA meeting and they said, come here okay um, as you can s so if you could see the whole thing it goes right around here this is the 200 foot line it goes around the tail race and back around so I'm wondering if you can help with that if you can write a letter to the ZBA yeah. that would confirming that right so these papers were filed by the applicant mm-hmm so I don't know how he can say now it's not because he already said it was a riverfront area. Yeah. And I also sent the old maps that showed, interestingly enough, there were originally two exits from the pond, and then it was altered when they dammed it up for power. For power, yeah. Yeah. Didn't okay. the contractor admit that at the first PIP meeting? contract uh, at the last the CBA meeting not the CBA the pit oh. meeting from the contractor who was going to he he may have admitted it but we have if you scroll down you can see part of the stormwater infiltration basin is in the riverfront area and he also has part of the wastewater treatment plant see it right there see we're okay we're we haven't got this project yet so that's part of um, 
why it's hard for us to make any determination on anything because we, right. we haven't received it from ZBA yet for them to determine what you know, planning's done and, and all okay, of that. So ZBA send it to us. Can you make any comments to the ZBA? We can, right. I believe. Uh, again, we'll check with Janet. Okay. But we can take the map and say, yeah, confirm the 200-foot uh, boundary and uh, we'll send a note to uh, the ZBA regarding our finding. Okay. Uh, but we don't, I think we can do that without um, having it in front of us. Um, it's just a point of fact. Okay, could, the more you can protect this area, the further away from contamination everything gets. So that's just one concern. Um, then there was another issue I had there were several issues in the letter, but one I wanted to bring up was that the um, removal of the overburden is a big concern as far as the water flows go. Once you do remove, he's down to 650,000 cubic yards. The water in the fissures in the ground will flow more freely because the pressure is taken off as you remove the overburden. So I'm not sure that was uh, accounted for in the calculations for the time to travel to the Norfolk, well, it's not the Norfolk Public Well, it's the Franklin Public Well. Um, and I wondered if you could look at that and ask that the wastewater discharge um, be looked at again, especially yeah, with I'm not sure on that topic if we can get involved at this time. But again, with uh, we need to get with Janet and go over some of the specifics and then s see what we can do as a memo for the file type of thing to the ZBA or planning board. But um, yeah, other than that, we really can't get into it until it's the applicant comes forward to us. So do you know when that happens? I don't know. Chris, do you know where this whole project is? We're still taking in testimony. But can this board send a letter to the ZBA? We can, yeah, we could do something, I th believe, on that, uh, just the confirming the 200 foot space. But, um, yeah, other than that, and so it's probably going to take a while for them to finish up with the ZBA. So, um, all right. Will you be notified? Okay. <laughs> when we get it. All right, so there were uh, one other issue that came up years ago was the, the two groundwater regimes that are, exist over there, and it's a complex system of water. And does the water fall within your um, purview to look at that? But not now. Not now, okay. But <laughs> it, there's an ongoing PIP with us, so has that been brought up to Right, to MABIT is the... Because um, the state, if I put correct, the state pulled their, their original um, permit because they weren't going to have enough time to finish their original one. So they're in the process of getting a new permit, which requires them to go to the state with exactly what they're going to do. Right. And he at this point, you as a constituent have a right to go to the state and say, I would like the borings done here for this reason. I'm concerned that you mentioned the tail weather um, being the tail being blocked, and by what and how, and um, where the runoff has gone off from all the pools, and have all the pools been identified, and how far down should the borings go, and where the borings should be, and that was all part of what the company has to do to provide information for the state. Um, no. So we have written multiple letters from the PIP petitioners, and we're waiting for the scope of work mm -hmm. from MABIT to be issued. So As of today, it wasn't issued. I looked on the DEP website. Yeah, so it, what's hard, I could talk to you afterwards, but it, we really can't do anything because it's not in front of us. So we can't, they, they have gone to the state, the state pulled the permit, and they are working, according to him, in good faith, 
to correct the issues that were known by the, the previous contractor and the lack of effort that was done by the owner. So right now, the state's saying they have a right to clean up that by their mass state law that they need to follow. So they started with the PIP to get um, all the involvement with the community, and, the, and then at that point, they come up with what their scope of work is going to be. And at that point, then it would either be the town planner or the town manager would say, look, my constituents have said A, B, and C. It's not in the plan. We agree it should be in the plan. So that's the point that we're at because right. we have commented on their draft scope of work, and hopefully they're going to incorporate our comments as well as any comments yeah. from the town's LSP, and that's what we're waiting to see. But we couldn't even comment really on that plan because they haven't cleaned up the site or found any delineations for us to look at because the site's not cleaned yet. Right. Well, the other issue is the wetlands delineations have expired over two years right. ago. They've got to reapply for everything, and it, yep. maybe the whole scope is going to be changed. So, um, yeah, until that's done, um, but and then it'll come in front of us. But as I said, we'll take a look at that, uh, the, the waterway and the 200-foot marks. Okay. Anybody else regarding uh, Thank you. the Abbeville? If you want to wait after the meeting, I can talk to you afterwards. Thank you for coming. Okay. Um, let's go to the request for a proposal for environmental services that uh, we voted on last month for 144 Seekonk Street. A proposal has been, a request for a proposal has been developed uh, by Rich McCarthy and Janet, and I have uh, gone over it. Um, and uh, it would uh, be sent to uh, people, uh, professionals, uh, to respond to it. Uh, we haven't heard from uh, Mr. O'Hart yet, have we, Amy? Not All we know is they've received our letter. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we'll go ahead and continue and get this in place so we can get some uh, quotes in uh, and review them. And, uh, do our selection so then uh, once we uh, so we're ready for the next step um, has everybody had a chance to read it I read it I, I, once we get the applicants in we, we were more concerned about how far from the alleged um, disruption that we go with the borings so that we can be have an adequate read on the specific soil soil type at certain depths up to the disruption so that we can actually see that, you know, for example, it was Sandy Loom, it's 14 inches. Over here, it's Sandy Loom at two inches mm -hmm. and a bunch of mulch and other organic materials that is not consistent with either side of the disturbed area. Right, and that's why their uh, walk has to take place. And um, we should set up flags for borings. And exactly. But yeah, we'll get into that with uh, our selected uh, company. Does anybody in the audience have uh, any comments or have they read the... Uh... Are you here for 144? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bruce? Hey. Okay, then why don't we, uh, I'll entertain a motion to accept this uh, draft of the request for a proposal for environmental services for 144 Seekonk Street. I will second the motion. Well, let's have a first. I move to um, <laughs> allow the request for proposal for um, environmental services for 144 Seekonk Street. Now I'll second the motion. Okay, any other questions, comments? Comments from the audience? Then all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's passed. Amy, uh, we can send this out tomorrow then. Okay. Talk, work with Rich, Great. and uh, we'll send it out to our 
uh, services that we typically send them out. What's that? Have they been cited on this, or is this what we're trying to figure That's out? what we're trying to do, is uh, validate uh, what the status is of uh, 144 mm -hmm. Seaconk Street. Okay. Okay. Um, just a few paperwork issues. We got something from uh, the Pondville homeowners, mm -hmm. and... Um, it looks like, I mean, they're going to do the same thing they did last year, but the pond lilies came back. Uh, we may want to talk to them to uh, suggest uh, alternate ways, uh, either herbicides or uh, mechanical, to uh, draw down their pond lilies. So, yeah, they, they seem to say here that it uh, hasn't gotten any worse, but... Yeah. I guess that means it hasn't gotten any better either. <laughs> um, I guess I think that's it. So with that, we can uh, close the meeting. Do you have any? Are you here? Are you with her? Yeah, same. Oh, okay. Um, if there's no other pieces of business, we'll wait on the property signs. Until next time, um, we'll close the meeting. I'll entertain a motion. <laughs> I move to close the meeting of January 9th, 2019. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. It's uh, all up. It's passed unanimously. The meeting is closed. Thank you.